You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's a well-known fact that William Shatner, James Doohan, and the great John Calicos, who played the, the first Klingon leader on Star Trek, were all Canadian. Now, when the Man Trap, the first episode broadcast, six produced by Star Trek, was premiered not in the States, but on Canadian television two days before it was shown on network TV in the States or NBC, it uh, caused a sensation so much so that in 1995, some three decades after it first was broadcast in Canada, it was shown during the election blackout in New Brunswick because of the uh, separation vote in Quebec. So people were turning on for the results and what they were seeing, the soft monster. Now, the man trap, written by the very, very uh, intelligent uh, scribe George Clayton Johnson, was directed by the great Mark Daniels. It was the first episode of season one and featured design work by Wa Chang and first aired in the States on September 8, 66, two, day, two days after it premiered in Canada. Now, <clears throat> Jerry says, uh, Finnerman and Alexander Courage joined together for the cinematography and music. Now, in this episode, and it's controversial from moment one because of his sexuality and horror tropes, the crew visited an outpost on planet M113 to conduct routine medical exams on the residents, only to be attacked by a shape-shifting alien who kills by literally sucking salt from the victim's body, thus burning them. This was the first, again, Star Trek episode to air on TV, although the sixth to be filmed. It was chosen to be the first of the series to be broadcast by the studio due to the horror plot. Then the Man Trap plays first in the time slot with a Nielsen rating of 25.2 for the first half hour and 24.2 for the remainder. Again, it aired two days earlier on Canadian network CTV. Now, CBC did not pick up Star Trek because they had nothing to show it they weren't sure they could show it before, uh, like, the evening news or whatever. But I did the BAFO ratings on CTV. Now, when the Enterprise arrives at the planet to provide supplies and medical exams for the only known inhabitants of the planet, Professor Robert Crater, Alfred Ryder, and his wife, Nancy Jean Ball, who operate an archaeological research station there, are the only residents. Captain Kirk, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Len McCoy, and crewman Darnell, played by a uh, young Michael Zaslow of soap opera fame, transport to the surface as Kirk teases McCoy about his affection for Nancy 10 years previously. They arrive at a research station, and each of the three men sees Nancy differently. McCoy sees her as she was when he first met her, Kirk as she would look accounting for her age, and Darnell as an attractive blonde woman whom he met on a pleasure planet. When Nancy goes out to fetch uh, her husband, she beckons Darnell to follow her, not in words, but with her blonde uh, body. Now, this is weird because if you see the episode, is she throwing out ESP or mind manipulation vibes? Because that's three different versions of Nancy that scene. The young prostitute, well, that's what it is, Pleasure Planet. The older Nancy and the younger Nancy. Now, Professor Crater is reluctant to be examined, telling Kirk that he only requires salt tablets. Before McCoy can complete the exam, they hear a scream from outside. They find Darnell dead with red ring-like molting on his face, a plant root in his mouth, and Nancy standing over him saying she was unable to stop Darnell from tasting the plant. On board the Enterprise, Spock analyzes the plant. He confirms that it is a poisonous, but that mottling is not a symptom. McCoy conducts a medical exam and together with Spock, determines that all the salt was drained from Darnell's body. In response... Kirk transports back down to the planet with McCoy and two crewmen Green, played by Bruce Watson, and Sturgeon, played by John Arndt. Kirk tells Professor Crater that he and his wife should stay aboard the Enterprise until they find out what killed Darnell. Crater then runs off trying to find Nancy, but Nancy kills both Sturgeon and Green. However, Green uh, is, uh, she, he, she, or they imitates Green. Both uh, faces show the same molting as Darnell. Again, when Nancy assumes the form of Green, he meets Kirk uh, and meets Kirk and McCoy. They beam back up their ship with Sturgeon's body. Now, Green roams the corridors, stalking several crew members, killing one. It shapeshifts in the form of McCoy after confirming that the real McCoy has taken a sedative to sleep. Now, he, uh, he already also changed into a very handsome black man because in the earlier episode, Uhura was, you know, on a romantic uh, kind of thought process. And uh, talk to Spock, you know, tell me what a, the moon on, on Vulcan looks like. And he said, Vulcan has no moon. He said, uh, 
So you were basically said, why am I not surprised? But in this episode, uh, she is very amorous. She wants to be swept off her feet, and she, she was almost hypnotized by the salt monster who was basically moving the hands. But the black actor, which I've never seen him before or since, really effective performance as well to the guy who played Green when uh, Kirk Yeoman and Sulu were uh, in a room together. And uh, she notices that, you know, if it's green, why have you gone space happy? And the animal that's a hand puppet is so scared of a green, it goes back. That's very effective as well. Uh, and it gives Sulu enough lines. George Takei gives a great performance. Now, as the episode goes on, Crater remains on the planet. Now, again, uh, it shapes it ships. Uh, green turns into Nancy, tells McCoy to rest. And uh, she, he goes asleep. Now, when Spock confirms that a scan shows a crater is the only one on the planet, Kirk and Spock beam down to capture him. He finds Green's body before a crater tries to frighten him away with phaser fire. After he's stunned with a phaser beam, a very effective slowdown special, slow down special effect, by the way, the day's crater reveals that the real Nancy was killed by the creature, the last member of a long-dead civilization of shapeshifters who feed on salt. A year earlier, the creature continued to take on the appearance of Nancy out of affection for Crater, and he has been feeding it, compared to the now extinct Buffalo. Kirk informs Enterprise of the creature's intrusion as the landing party and Crater transport back to the ship. Now, Crater was saying we don't want to be bothered, and he said all we need is salt, and he showed a bottle of salt, which from a plot standpoint don't make sense. Did she pretend to be Nancy, and did, uh, did the character have sex with Crater? We don't know, but it's kind of implied. Creepy. Now, Crater refused to help to identify the creature because he's asked, can you can you notice this guy when he shifts? So Carrick orders the fake McCoy to administer a truth serum. Kirk arrives in sick bay to find Crater dead and Spock injured. Spock's Vulcan blood made him incompatible with the creature's needs. Back in its Nancy form, the creature goes to McCoy's quarters. Kirk arrives with a phaser to provoke the creature and attacking McCoy, uh, gets in the way, and giving us the creature the opportunity to attack Kirk. The creature reverts to his natural appearance and starts to feed on Kirk uh, a few seconds after Spock is really laid out to Nancy in Nancy form. McCoy opens fire with his phaser. The cheap creature changed back to the shape of Nancy to plead for its life as McCoy continues firing and kills it. As the Enterprise leaves over it, Kirk comments to Spock that he was thinking about the buffalo. Very effective episode from start to finish, even though it was plot holes galore. Like I said, was the, the crater salt monster using ESP? Why did it decide to make the special effects and look like kind of a reject from a, a bad, uh, you know, um, what do you call a, a time tunnel or, you know, going back to the, but you know what I'm talking about, going back in time, the, uh, the, uh, the time machine, thank you, uh, like the Morlocks, eh? But it works in a lot of levels because the acting is strong here. Each, there's about 15 or 16 supporting roles here is quite a few and Mac Michael's asshole seeing him at the first is kind of shocking because you know gliding light and different shows he was on but everybody's effective in the show now the idea about uh, the DeForest Kelly he wasn't overshadowed by uh, Kirk in here because it was saying I have a pass and uh, it shows that the camaraderie between Kirk and uh, and McCoy now again the Man Trap had appeared in Gene Roddenberry's original picture of Star Trek as the title of a show with a different plot. The crew faced several apparitions that are wishful living traps, which become as real as flesh and blood. The traps increased in subtlety until the crew struggled to differentiate between apparition and reality. Again, uh, episode title led to a different type of script. Now, uh, 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 Johnson wrote a first draft uh, teleplay titled Damsel with a Dulcimer. While writing, Johnson consulted many people on the show who advised him to place the creature on the Enterprise quickly to increase the pace of the episode. The draft was delivered on May 23rd, but NBC felt that hallucinations were being overused. The same plot device had appeared in the pilot episode, The Cage. He wrote another draft on May 31st, which reduced the number of apparitions, and this was well received. Uh, numerous uh, tweaks were done, including by Roddenberry, and he decided to restore the name Man Trap from uh, the original treatment of the episode. Another removed the scene, which introduced McCoy's apprehension when using a transporter, which is alluded to several times during the movies. Now, Johnson uh, did a whole bunch of rewrites. Now, uh, like I said, good bunch of character actors here. Uh, Gene Ball was tremendous as Nancy Crater, McCoy's favorite love, love interest. Uh, now, Alfred 
Now, this is uh, this episode has been thought about very uh, effectually by Star Trek uh, fans, and it was sort of like a different take uh, than other series as well, series episodes as well, because it went uh, it went uh, fast. Now, the broadcast of the show a month prior to its premiere. Desilu, who owned the property, the Lucille Ball Company, held a screening for ABC and executives to help decide which episode to broadcast first, and several stories were considered. Executives were concerned that Mud's women, one potential choice, would have reviewers discussing space hookers. They felt another possibility where no man has gone before, the second pilot, contained too much exposition, even though, again, it was filmed as a second pilot. The final choice was between a man trap and a naked time, Justman felt that the naked time would make it easier for viewers to understand the characters, but later agreed with NBC's decision to show the man trap first. In the book inside Star Trek The Real Story, it was suggested that it would be scarier and more exploitable than the others. Now, six episodes shown, six episodes produced first shown. Although Rodberry initially disagreed with NBC's decision, he and production executive Herbert Franklin Solo came to believe it was the correct choice. Shatner also disagreed with the network, feeling that the Man Trap was the worst episode of those available. The episode was the first one of Star Trek broadcast in the States, but the Man Trap also formed part of NBC's Sneak and Peek Week, in which the network showed a premier episodes of several new shows in primetime slots, ahead of the rival channels ABC and CBS, who were still showing repeats from the previous season. Leading into Star Trek was the first episode of Tarzan showing Ron Eli, and leading out was Richard Mulligan's The Hero. Again, good ratings, uh, 42.2% of TVs turned in. Now, uh, Bewitched uh, was the dominant uh, of that time, and he went up uh, against Tammy Grimes and My Tree Sons, which had lower ratings. Now, the following episodes did see a drop in ratings after The Man Trap. Charlie X was broadcast the following week, and the studio didn't want that episode to run second, but Where No Man Has Gone Before was the only other completed story, and it had to place second in the time slot during the first half hour with a rating of 19.1 and an overall share of 35.9. My Tree Sons bet it out. During the second half hour, Star Trek was pushed to the third uh, behind Bewitched. And, uh, but when Where No Man was gone before, ratings went up to 19.9. So word was getting around. Now, uh, the, the UK release, the first episodes of Star Trek, came out years later, uh, a different, uh, uh, now CTV aired episodes of the first season of Star Trek on Tuesday nights instead of Thursdays. And so ran the man trap on September 6th, two days before NBC airing American programs early was a common practice among Canadian broadcasters in order to avoid direct competition for viewers and advertisers with American border stations along the same program at the same time. The practice became obsolete once the controversial simultaneous substitution of commercials was permitted. Now, uh, a high-definition remastering of the Man Trap came out in 2007. It's quite good, actually. It holds up uh, in many factors. It had uh, new special effects, the Starship interiors, as well as enhanced music and audio, and it was shown for the first time in broadcast syndication on September 29, 2007. It was made available to over 200 local stations across the states with the rights to broadcast Star Trek. Now, uh, the Hollywood Reporter called the episode a winner. Me, I gave it four stars out of four, not because it's a perfect uh, episode, but it's uh, it's well put together because you it's believable. The person you fall in love with, okay, you don't see him for a while. You can make up your own story. Obviously, you don't see a person that you fell in love with 25 years. Uh, before this, uh, the same 25 years later, you might look a bit younger. So it plays on a lot of things. McCoy's loneliness, which is talking about later on in the series, Shatter's toughness, Nimoy has to protect the captain and the whole staff, but uh, the uh, what he called the grumpy uh, scientist, which is an old you know, horror trope, but uh, the, the special effects were put into the Salt Monster. Like it holds up, it's like, you know, 50 plus years later, it really holds up. Scared to live the shit out of me. Some of my friends try to go out on Halloween one year as it. It doesn't work that way. There's not enough abandoned mops could have done that. So, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the support of our Star Trek reviews. We've been doing a pretty good last few days, several thousand hits. If you continue to like what we're doing and follow and listen, we're going to keep on doing it. Keep it up. Give me a like, comment, subscribe, or share. And don't forget, if someone sucks your salt, get away. <laughs>